Well, thank you. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Yes? I'm so excited to be at church this Sunday. Um, But can you believe, like, Christmas is already over? It's like all that preparation, and it's over in one day. (laughs) Not going to lie. Like, one second it was, like, 80 degrees outside, and the next it's Christmas. Oh, it was 80 degrees on Christmas. Welcome to Virginia Beach, folks. Um, but no, I love the holiday season. I love this time of year. It's, there's so much joy. There's so much food. Um, there's so much friends and family coming around. And it's just, it's a great time to really just relax and, and be with those you love. Um, but I'm also glad it's over. Just the stress is done. Finding the perfect gift. Making sure that all the family can be in the same place at the same time. You didn't leave the gifts at home. You bake the food right. There's just so much going on in that. Um, and then right after Christmas, we have New Year's. I love New Year's. Um, it's a great time. It's, it's less stressful than Christmas, right? Um, if you have a, a gathering of people, um, it's usually low-key. You're just kind of relaxing with friends, um, or maybe you're staying home with family and just watching the ball drop. And I love doing that as well until that like one person of the group decides to say, hey, let's go around and, and let's say our New Year's resolutions. Now, if you're like me, you haven't thought about it at all. <laughs> the craziness of Christmas has just been distracting. You haven't really thought about New Year's resolutions. And so you're watching all these people come around with these awesome goals that they have for their new year, and you're like, oh, I should probably do that. I should probably reflect on 2015. Now, I love goals. I love setting goals because it allows us to reach towards something, allows us to, to grow um, as, a, as a person. Um, but there's a reason New Year's resolutions kind of have a bad rap. You guys, have you ever noticed that? There's also a reason why they tell you never go to the gym in January, because it's packed. So many people, because everyone wants to get fit, everyone wants to get healthy. And then right after January, they're all gone, (laughs) because it's hard. So if you want to work out this year, start in February. It'll work. Maybe it'll work then, you know? But no, goals goals are great for our lives. So when, when it eventually came around to me, usually in these conversations, I pull something really quick out of my hat, like, Oh, I want to save money. Or, oh, I need to eat healthier instead of having Chick-fil-A every day. Or, oh, I, I want to spend more time with my family, which are all amazing goals. Now, again, I love goals. I absolutely love them. I think New Year's resolutions are great. But I found this study when I was preparing for my message that said that only 43% of Americans set New Year's resolutions. And then of those people, 8% actually follow through with them. That's a crazy statistic. I'm not going to lie. I'm in the 92%. <laughs> when I set goals, I often forget about them because it's just not something that I've put all this time into. Um, so I want to ask you guys a question. So raise your hand if you've ever had this goal, this desire to do something great, and it seems like every time you do it, there's just like an obstacle in your way. Yeah? That's me. Those are tough. And what happens when those happen? We say, oh, well, if it was meant to be, it would be. Or if it was supposed to happen, it would have happened. Or they don't want me to reach my goals. Now, several years ago, um, I had this goal for my life. I had set a plan. I, I, was, I was really excited. I was actually at George Mason University at the time. And I was moving back. I felt called back to Virginia Beach. Um, and I was so excited because I, I was just ready for this new chapter of my life. Now, before I continue, I just want to let you know how I am a little bit. Now, I like plans. I like to know what's happening. I like to know when it's happening. I like to know how long it's going to happen. And I need to know in advance so I can prepare myself. Spontaneity is not really great with me. <laughs> Anybody else like that? Okay. So you know, you know where I'm coming from. So I had this plan for my life. But I don't think you can ever be 100% prepared for the stress, the emotions, and the learning that is with moving out of your parents' home. Can anyone remember their experience? Some of you are chuckling. (laughs) Maybe that was your experience. Maybe you're going through it right now with your own children. Um, It's a crazy time. Obviously, we want to respect our parents. We want to respect the the years that they've they've put into raising us and, and supporting us and making sacrifices that we aren't even aware of. But also, there's this natural inclination to be independent, to be to to step into adulthood. So there's this stress part. That was my plan. I wanted to move out and step on my own two feet. So I'm coming home from George Mason. My car is loaded. It's packed up. 
I always left at night because the roads were clear. And this particular night, it was beautiful. It's not a cloud in the sky, the stars were shining, the roads were clear. Um, and so I'm driving down I-95 South. Now the speed limit gets up to 75, so I'm coasting. I'm doing well. And after about an hour and a half, I'm almost to Richmond, and I start getting a little comfortable. You know, no one's on the road, it's just me by myself. I turn my music up a little bit, you know. I'm kind of leaning back in my chair, just relaxing. And then all of a sudden, I see those dreaded red and blue lights in my rearview mirror. <sighs> now in those moments, same, you know, I like plans, I like to know what's going on. So the average person would be like, oh snap, I'm getting a ticket. In my head, I was like, I'm going to jail. That's it. <laughs> this is happening. It's over. I need to call my mom and my dad right now because I'm going to jail. <laughs> Obviously, that didn't happen. So I pull over. We go through the motions, license, registration, all that, that aspect. He writes me a ticket, and we, we part ways. And I'm looking down at the ticket before I, I pull off on the side of the road. You know, I'm examining everything, court date, et cetera, et cetera. And I look down, and I see it says reckless driving. So I'm thinking to myself, how did I get a reckless driving ticket? There's no one on the road. I'm not swerving in and out of the place. I'm definitely not going 20 miles over the speed limit. Like, what is going on? And it was that day that I learned in the Commonwealth of Virginia, anything over 80 miles per hour is reckless driving. So, you know, we coast sometimes. You go a little over the speed limit. So that happened to me. And so I have another two hours on my way home to think about this ticket. <laughs> and so now I'm getting nervous because this is a wrench in my plan. This is, I've thrown a wrench in my plan. Financially, this is going to be really hard to deal with right away. And so I'm thinking, oh gosh, now I have to tell my parents out of respect for them. They need to know that, that I've messed up. I need to honor them and let them know. And so I'm so nervous. I'm thinking about it the whole way home, and I could not possibly think of a way to tell them. So naturally, I waited about a month. <laughs> And I thought, the best way to tell someone is to butter them up a little bit, you know? So I texted my mom. I said, hey, mom, I'd love to bring you food to work today. And she said, oh, my gosh, it's so nice. I would love for that. And so she told me what I want. I ended up picking Chick-fil-A, and we went to her, her office. I'm sitting there. I'm eating. And after 15 minutes of having a great conversation, she looks at me, and she says, what's wrong? <laughs> so, what do you mean? She's like, are you moving out? I was, I was like, gosh. Moms really do know everything. <laughs> it's like, I mean, yes, but that's not all that I have to tell you. And she says, oh, gosh, what is it? And so I tell her, I said, Mother, I got a speeding ticket on my way home from George Mason. She said, you waited that long to tell me? And then immediately it clicked in her face, and I saw half of her face was kind of like a little upset, and the other half was relieved. And then after that, she goes, oh, my gosh, thank the Lord. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean, thank God? She's like, I thought I got a ticket. <laughs> she said, for the past few weeks, we've been getting letters from lawyers. I thought I ran a red light and have to tell your father. <laughs> like, okay, this is going better than I thought. <laughs> so fast forward, my parents were extremely supportive during this time. They, they helped me um, along with the process. They went to court with me. Um, and there's also something you should know about my parents. They would support me if anything happened. If I needed to move back home, they would definitely let me. Not forever. <laughs> but they, they would definitely welcome me back with open arms. So I'm going through the court process. I, I, I go to court. It doesn't end the way that I would like it to, so I end up appealing it. I hire a lawyer, and I get the charge reduced. Um, and so here I am, thinking this whole time I was so stressed about my plan that I had when I came home. I wanted to step out on my own two feet. I had a, a place already lined up. I had a job already lined up. I was ready. And I just threw a wrench in it. I prolonged it. I thought, honestly, I thought it wasn't going to happen anytime soon. So that happens a lot in life, doesn't it? We have these plans. We have these goals. We have things we want to do in life. And we throw wrenches in them or obstacles come in our way or things happen where we can't complete our task just yet. And I was definitely telling myself that it was never going to happen. You know, sometimes our plans don't go the way we want them to. There are obstacles, there's detours, there's wrenches. Sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's out of our control. 
My message today is titled, There's Been a Change of Plans. And I, I, I feel like God placed this message on my heart because we're entering into a new year. And we're going to set goals for ourselves. We're going to reflect on the past. And those goals are going to get interrupted. But what I love about the story that I'm going to share is that when God gives us a promise, he doesn't abandon it. When obstacles come our way, they're only temporary. We have to keep driving forward to the goals and the promises that he's placed on our lives. And I know you're thinking, Parker, you have no idea what's going on in my life. You don't know the unexpected things, the obstacles that I've had to deal with. You're right, I don't. But I know God's faithful. I know God will never change. So before I start talking about how to persevere, I do want to talk about the things that often trip us up. So I have three hurdles of goal setting for you guys, and they're there on your outline. The first one is, my goals are too complicated. Now, God's all about dreaming big. But when our goals get too complicated, sometimes they get intimidating. Sometimes we can't actually achieve them because they're so outrageous. So keep them simple. Number two, my goals are too forgettable. My goals are too forgettable. Sometimes we set goals, and like me, we forget about them. We don't remind ourselves we don't have accountability. We don't have someone running with us. So we forget about them. And number three, my goals are self-fulfilling. My goals are self-fulfilling. If we don't believe that we can accomplish our goals, we're not going to. You guys heard of a self-fulfilling prophecy? Our goals act like that sometimes. We trip ourselves up with our own mindset. So these are the three reasons most people miss out on their goals. And I have a story I want to share with you from the Bible, the Old Testament, the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph was the son of Jacob, and both of them are pretty prominent uh, members in the Old Testament. They have, have, um, they're the figures that we associate a lot to the establishing the nation of Israel today. So Joseph had 11 siblings, 11 brothers, and he was one of the youngest. But he definitely was his father's favorite. And we see that because his dad gave him this awesome, colorful coat. Now, you're probably saying, Parker, it's just a coat. I've got coats. But this coat was very different. See, most people actually had coats at that time. But the normal coat would have been very plain colored. It would have gone to about the knee, um, and it would have been purely functional. So you'd have pockets to store your things. You'd wear it to keep warm. And then if you needed to get a loan, you could actually use it as a deposit as a, or a security. Um, so when you pay off the loan, you get your coat back. But Joseph's would have been really colorful. I have a picture for you guys. Many interpretations on what this could look like. Here's the first one. All right, let's go to the next one. It's like a glamour shot, you know? And then my personal favorite, the last one. It's a great movie. So these co- this coat would have been elegant. The colors would have cost a lot to dye, and you would have had to taken more time to do it. And what I love most about this coat is this is the type of coat a king would have given his virgin daughter or the type of coat a father would have given his firstborn son. So this coat had honor established with it. It had purity. This was an amazing coat. So you can imagine the rest of his brothers were pretty jealous because Joseph was very young. They were all older than him. And we can also assume that this wasn't the first time that Joseph uh, was favorited. So his brothers were very jealous, and after he gets this coat, I want you to remember the importance of this coat, because it propels Joseph into the rest of his life. It signifies the honor that God is going to one day give him. So we see in Genesis 37, after he receives this coat, God gives him a dream. And it says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain and out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Joseph's brothers were furious. Their youngest brother, were they supposed to bow down to him? Was he really going to have that much honor and authority that the universe would come to Joseph and bow down to him? So they get angry. They get upset. And like any unsane person would do, they plan to get rid of their brother. 
<laughs> so here we see in Genesis 37 again, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern, which was like a place for storing water. So it was an empty hole. Um, and it was empty and there was no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Jalad. The camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our own brother, our own flesh and blood. That makes me thankful for my brothers. <laughs> so then, after selling their, their brother to slavery, they take the coat back to their father. And, they, and then they took the robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped it in blood, and they brought it back to their father. We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's. He recognized it and said, It's my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So here Joseph is, after dreaming these amazing God-given dreams, that he will one day have all this honor and authority, that people will come and bow down to him, and now he's a slave? That doesn't seem like God's promise. That doesn't seem like the honor from the coat that he just received from his father. He's at his lowest right now. You can't get much more low than being a slave. Sometimes we're like Joseph. We get to these points in life where we feel so low, and we feel like our promise is nowhere in sight. It's unreachable. It was false. Sometimes our disappointment is a little different. Sometimes we feel like we're going towards our goals, but we're constantly going in circles. We're never really going anywhere. Or maybe you are going to your goal, but you feel like you're crawling, and everyone else is speeding by you. There seems to be no hope, no sight. You once had a promising life, but now something has happened to, to mess that up. Let's see what happens to Joseph. See, Joseph is taken to Egypt, where he's purchased yet again as a slave by Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was one of the Pharaoh's royal officials. He was actually the captain of the guard. So it says, The Lord was with Joseph that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success, in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Now I would be thinking, it's not the exact ideal situation. Things seem to be getting better. I'm no longer just a slave. I have responsibilities. I'm trusted. But this isn't my promise. This isn't my goal. But the verse says, the Lord was with him. I know what you're thinking. How could the Lord possibly be with him at this time? He's a slave. But we see that he prospered. We see that he was faithful, that God was with him in this circumstance. He was going to see him through it. And so he blessed him. And that was noticed by his master. So just when you think Joseph's situation is, is on the up, enter Potiphar's wife. It says, Now Joseph was well-built and handsome, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. Very direct woman. But he refused. <clears throat> with me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be around her. Whew, we think Joseph's in the clear. He sees his distraction. He sees what's going to pull him away from his purpose, and he dodges it real quick. Not exactly. I'd like to give you a little illustration. Um, in middle school and high school, I ran track. It was very fun. I did long distance, so I was like running the miles, running the half mile. We'd often cross-train with the sprinters. And so we would run hurdles. And if you're unsure what a hurdle is, I have a picture for you. <clears throat> Those are the, the hurdles. And so you'd be on the track, looking ahead. It's a straightaway. You can see the hurdle coming towards you. And you'd run and you'd sprint. And ideally, you jump over, you keep running, jump over, and you keep running. This is normally what happened to me. Show the next picture. Yeah. See, I could see the hurdle coming. <laughs> it wasn't moving. I was moving. But I would jump over it, my leg would nick it, and I'd fall right on the ground. 
See, sometimes that happens in life. Sometimes we can see distractions. We just don't quite clear it. We fall. But it's in those moments we have to make a decision. Are we going to stay there? Are we going to stay on the ground in our shame? Are we going to get up and keep running? So we're thinking Joseph dodged it. We're thinking Joseph cleared his hurdle. But here we see it says, One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me yet again. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Of course, Potiphar hears about this, and he's going to believe his wife and all of the servants who now believe his wife as well. So while Joseph, so after this, Potiphar puts him in prison. Not just any prison. The Pharaoh's prison. So this is the prison where he keeps some pretty bad people. And we see while he's in prison, it says, But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. There it is again, that phrase. And the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Even in prison, the Lord was with him. And we see that again because he prospered. The Lord said, I know this isn't your promise yet, but I'm going to see you through this. You're going to prosper. And the prison wardens saw the Lord's blessing on him and advanced him. This brings me to my first point from this story. It says, God is with me when I fall. God is with me when I fall. God had no intention of letting go of Joseph's dream. No intention whatsoever. He also has no intention of letting go of our dreams, of our goals. Whether it's, it's serving people, raising godly children, advancing in your career. When we align our hearts to, to God, when we look for the things that he has for us, God will bless us. He will be with us. We will prosper. And sometimes things don't go the way we want them to. We have this well-thought-out plan. We have a timeline. We have a budget. But God says, you know, there's been a change of plans. I see what's going on. Don't worry. I see it. I'm going to get you through it. And what I love is that Joseph's dreams weren't really too complicated. And he held on to them. I believe that he had to remind himself daily of his dreams, especially in prison, especially as a slave. I know that God has something amazing for all of us in this room. God has plans and and dreams and purposes. And as we're going into 2016, I think it's so awesome that we're starting a new series called Designing Your Destiny. It's all about looking towards the destiny that God has for us, understanding that sometimes we miss it, sometimes we don't quite get it, but it's our choice to go after what he has for us. So don't miss that series. It's only four weeks long. It's going to be amazing. Start your year off right, designing your destiny. But let's jump back into the story real quick. While Joseph was in prison, he meets the king's cupbearer and the baker. Now, they've been imprisoned. And so while Joseph is, is attending to his duties, one night the cupbearer and the baker have dreams. And they're confused about it. And they bring it before Joseph. And Joseph interprets it for them. Now he looks to the cupbearer and he says, Your dream means that in three days, the Pharaoh is going to restore your position. You will no longer be in prison. And the baker's like, All right, that's a pretty good dream. Interpret mine for me. And Joseph looks to me and he says, Unfortunately, your dream means that in three days, the Pharaoh is going to kill you. He got a short stick. (laughs) But... Joseph looks to the cupbearer and he says, remember me when you come into your position. So what happens? He forgets about him. He forgets Joseph. And two whole years go by. Two years. See, sometimes our obstacles aren't hurdles. You're not just jumping over them, falling down, getting back up and keep running. Sometimes you get knocked down pretty hard. They they look less like hurdles and look more like a dark cave or a valley. But remember, God was with Joseph. 
and Joseph prospered. So what's your Joseph moment? What's that moment when it seems like you're advancing, but you get sidetracked or detoured, that hurdle shows up, you can't quite clear it? Well, let's see what happens to Joseph. So after these two years go by, the Pharaoh has a dream. And he wakes up, he doesn't understand it, and then he falls asleep again, has another dream, wakes up, still confused. So he says to his people, I need you to call every wise man, every magician in, in all of Egypt. Bring them here. They need to interpret my dream. But no one can do it. No one's able to do it. And it's at that moment that the cupbearer finally remembers Joseph. He looks to the Pharaoh and says, hey, I once had a dream, and Joseph was able to interpret it for me. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that you hear a dream, and you can interpret it. I cannot, says Joseph. But God will give Pharaoh what he desires. When I first read this, I was like, Joseph, this is your time to shine. This is your time to step up and, and show Pharaoh what you can do. Step into your promise. But instead, he gives credit to God. He says, I can't do it on my own. But God can. That brings me to my next point. God is the strength in my weakness. God is the strength in my weakness. I found often when I can't achieve my goals, it's usually because the foundation, the reason for me trying to complete my goals is just a little bit off. Maybe I'm doing it for my own gain, I'm doing it for selfish reasons, or I'm really insecure and I'm trying to cover up my imperfections. I become so focused on, on, what I'm, on me that I forget what my goal is, I forget what I'm, I'm trying to accomplish. But when we give credit to God, we humble ourselves and we allow Him to work in our lives. We allow Him to move, to bless us, and to heal us on the inside. See, Joseph was faithful and God blessed him yet again. If we need God to move in our marriages, we have to give him our marriage. If we want God to move in our, our careers, we need to give him our careers. We need to act like God wants us to have our goals. If we want God to bless our finances, we need to trust him with our finances. Oftentimes I'll hear, well, God, you know, if I get that raise, Lord, I swear I'm going to start tithing. Lord, you give me that promotion, I'm going to tithe 10%, Lord. Or, God, I just really need this new job. I swear I'll start tithing. But when we trust God in the beginning, that's when he blesses us. We can't ask for something we haven't been faithful for. So when we trust in God, we know, we can be confident, we can be sure that he'll bless us tenfold. I have a verse for you. In Philippians 1.6, it says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion of the day of Jesus Christ. See, the story isn't over. Joseph does, in fact, interpret the Pharaoh's dream, which predicts seven years of abundance in food in Egypt. And then after that, seven years of famine, seven years of nothing. So Joseph looks to Pharaoh, he says, You need to prepare for this. You need to get someone in charge of this so that we will be okay in those seven years of famine. And then Joseph, or Pharaoh looks to Joseph and says, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all of my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh made Joseph essentially governor of Egypt. There it is. He stepped into this authority. He stepped into this honor. And so Joseph was successful for those seven years of famine. He, he was able to store up enough food to have enough for Egypt and all the lands. See, all the lands are also in a famine. So they get hungry. They, they know that Egypt has food. So they start traveling to Egypt to purchase food. And what happens is when they come to them, they would request. They make their request, but they would bow to Joseph. And so Joseph's family, not knowing that he's still alive, goes to Egypt, hungry. And they bow before Joseph, not realizing that it's him, and saying, can we please have some food? Boom. There it is. Joseph's dream. Estimated about 23 years later, his family is bowing before him. All of Egypt and all of the lands are bowing before him. 
even though he was sold by his brothers into slavery, even though he's abandoned into this new culture, this unknown place, God was faithful. That brings me to my last point. My dreams are not lost. My dreams are not lost. See, God has not changed in the amount of time that it took Joseph to have his dream and for it to be fulfilled. God never changes. It's so simple, but it's such a great reminder. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. I believe there's no way Joseph could have stepped into his promise if he wasn't faithful to God, if he wasn't reminding himself daily, if he wasn't remembering his promise. Never forget that your promises aren't lost. 23 years went by. 23 years. That's a long time. Sometimes we're in these places where we feel like our promises are lost, like our goal is completely unreachable. It's been so long since we've made ground. Joseph reached his promise. We can too. Your life is never a lost cause because what God once said is still relevant today. Notice in every hardship, the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph and Jesus is also with us. In all circumstances, in all trials, in all insecurities, Jesus is with us. He wants the best for us. He wants us to prosper and to step in to what God has for us. I want to speak in faith, knowing that whatever promises that God has placed in your heart when you align yourself to Him, He will complete that good work. He will complete it. So when someone asks you about your New Year's resolutions for 2016 or or when you want to go set a goal, really think about them. Know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life and He's so ready. He's so ready for you to step into that. We also have that series coming up. If you want to step into your destiny, commit to those four weeks. It's going to be amazing. God wants us to reach our goals. Some people need to hear that today. God wants you to reach your goals. God wants you to reach your promise. It may be a while. The plans may have changed in your eyes, but God sees it. God sees through it. But know that most importantly, throughout the entire process, God never changes. His love is the same. His grace for us is the same. One of my favorite verses is in 2 Corinthians. It says, For he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When we are weak, we're made strong in him. Pray with me. Father, I just thank you so much for your faithfulness, Lord. I thank you for your goodness, Father. I thank you that you do not give up on us, Lord. That you have not forgotten us, Lord. That our promise remains, Lord. I speak that over everyone's life, Father. Jesus, would you help us start the new year off right? Would you help us prepare right now, Lord? May we set goals worthy of who you are. And may we stick to them, Father. If you felt like God was speaking over your heart today, if you have never trusted in him, or maybe you're on that detour, You've walked off the path. I would just like to pray a simple prayer with you. If you could repeat that in your heart. To ask God to come in and to move. So pray this with me. Jesus, I know there are times where I've messed up. God, I know there's times where I get off track, Lord. But would you forgive me for my mistakes? Would your grace come in and move into my life, Lord? Father, would you make me new? Would you renew my heart, God? Would you renew my soul? Lord, I trust in you today. Jesus, I choose to follow you. Leave the path behind. Leave the mistakes behind. And look towards your love. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys would just stand with me real quick, if you, if you can. If that was you, if you felt like God was speaking to you, moving on your heart, I encourage you to fill out a Connect card. And you can drop it in those boxes on your way out or at the info desk. Let us know so we can walk with you in that, so we can encourage you with that. But also, we're going to have a prayer team up front. 
If you want prayer for anything whatsoever, come down. Come down and get some prayer. I'm going to close in prayer once again and then we'll be dismissed. God, I just thank you for this year, Lord. I thank you for this day. God, would you give us joy as we go into the new year? God, may we be safe and may we just enjoy the company of our friends, Father. We love you so much, God, and we love this body of, uh, of believers, Lord. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, see you guys next week. Happy New Year.